Now, maybe the most exciting of all the discovery stories for, for Cambridge is the, is the Watson and Crick story and the whole story of what's called the molecular biological revolution. And this is the third big discovery that I talk about that's not compatible with the scientific materialism of Richard Dawkins. The fine tuning isn't, by the way, as well. It's not a property you would expect if you were trying to explain the universe by reference to blind, pitiless indifference. Um, the the, the go-to atheistic explanation now is that there's a gabillion other universes out there and we just happen to be in the lucky one where all the fine-tuning parameters got just right. Um, we can talk about that in the Q&A if you like. In any case, the big discovery, the, perhaps the most famous of all the discoveries with God-friendly implications, was the, the discovery of DNA and not just the, the structure of DNA, which was first discovered here in 1953, but also the discovery that DNA contains digital information, information in uh, an alphabetic or digital form. The discovery was first made by Watson and Crick, uh, the, the elucidation of the, of the DNA structure was first made by Watson and Crick in 1953. And their famous model involved uh, what was called a sugar phosphate backbone, and then what were called bases that were carrying information along the inside of the, of, of the molecule. In, in, on February 28th, 1953, they walked into a pub, the Eagle Pub. Some of us have been talking about uh, going there and having a pint to celebrate. It's pretty, it's, this was also the watering hole of Wil William Wilberforce, by the way. Um, and it's just, it's just steps away from that Cavendish door, which I think is, is lovely because inside the Cavendish laboratory, you can look in the window where Watson and Crick were doing their modeling. And so if you find the door, look in the window to the right, and you'll see where they were working out the structure of the DNA molecule. The day they, they, they figured it out and it clicked, all the pieces clicked into place, Crick stood back and said, it's so beautiful, it's got to be right. And so they walked down the street just a few hundred steps to the Eagle Pub and announced to the people there drinking that they had discovered the secret of life. I don't know if it was drinks on the house or not, but it was a, you know, quite, quite an atmosphere. And today, you'll, right outside the pub, you'll see a plaque, uh, and you can see that if you go on the, well, this, this, these pictures are in your self-guided walking tour. Now, I think an even more significant discovery was made by, by Francis Crick five years later. In, in 1958, he formulated something called the sequence hypothesis. And what he realized was that along the interior of that twisting double helix were chemical subunits of the molecule that were functioning like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters, zeros and ones in a section of machine code. You may know that Bill Gates has said the DNA is like a software program, but much more complex than any we've ever written. It's a pretty suggestive remark. We'll come back to that. And Crick, uh, was the first to realize that DNA is containing information in a digital form. And what he thought the information was doing was providing instructions for building the big protein molecules that are crucial to keeping living cells alive. You may have seen some of my, my uh, visual aids on this, but proteins are made of smaller subunits called amino acids. And if they're arranged just right, then the forces between them will ca cause these long chain-like molecules to fold into very specific shapes. And then those shapes will perform, uh, if, the, if the shapes are right, then they have a hand and glove uh, fit with other molecules in the cell, and, uh, and then they'll do a job. And they do lots of jobs. They do all the important jobs. You can think of proteins as like the toolbox of the cell, just as in the toolbox, we have a hammer and a, and a, and a, and a wrench and a saw, and they do jobs in virtue of their, their, their three-dimensional shape and structure. Well, the same thing is true in the proteins. Some of them catalyze reactions. Some of them um, express the information on DNA. Others of them form the parts of miniature machines that cells need to stay alive. So there's all this intricate machinery in cells, and it's all made from, and, 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 and the machines are made of the proteins, and the proteins are constructed as a result of the information on the DNA molecule. So a good analogy would be um, something like, are people familiar with digital printers? Do you, are you familiar with those? The way, now we can, yeah, we can use digital code and the printers will print, they don't print out paper, they print out you know, pieces of garage doors or, or you know, you know, physical objects that do things. 
or uh, engineers here will be familiar with the CAD CAM technology, computer assisted design and engineering. In Seattle, we have Boeing, and at Boeing, the, the, uh, the, 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 the engineers will write code, the code will go down a wire, it will be converted into another machine language that can be read at a manufacturing apparatus, and then the ap ap manufacturing apparatus will put the, the, for example, the rivets on the airplane wing in just the right place in accord with the specifications of the code written by the engineer. So we, use, we do this all the time now. We have digital information directing the construction of mechanical parts and systems. That's what's going on inside cells. And that's what Crick first realized, and it was later confirmed by a whole series of really fascinating exper experiments. Now, one of the other scientists who was here at Cambridge was the guy who figured out what the proteins were doing. And so you had the DNA guys and the protein guys right here at the same time figuring it all out. And now there's a, a laboratory that, that and then the guy, that would, the, one of the key guys here was named Max Perutz. He got the Nobel Prize in 1962 for his work on protein structure. Watson and Crick got their Nobel Prize about the same time. And they now, th this period of an immense scientific creativity, which is almost all happening here, although Rockefeller Institute got into it, some people in France as well, but it was it's an amazing story how they, how they uncracked this. What's really fun is that Francis Crick was a code breaker in World War II, and he ended up breaking the ultimate code. The irony is that Crick and Watson were also strict scientific materialists. They were atheists, and they were looking for the material basis for life. And they thought they found it in 1953 until Crick realized it's not just a molecule, it's a molecule that contains code. And that discovery ends up being foundational. It provides evidence of what we're going to call intelligent design. And it, is, it has created a complete impasse in evolutionary theory. People cannot account for the origin of the information needed to build the first life or subsequent forms of life. I don't know if, if Doug is here in the room. Uh, we'll hear a little bit later in the week from Doug. He's another great Cambridge scientist. And I don't say that just because he's my friend. He did an amazing bit of work here for 14 years. And he interacted with Max Perutz. He was in the laboratory that Watson, Crick, and Perutz and others founded called the, LL, uh, uh, the, uh, the Laboratory for Molecular Biology right here. In, so we'll hear a bit more of Doug's story later in the week. But in any case, even though Watson and Crick were looking for the material foundation for life, what they actually found was something more like software. And, uh, and uh, Bill Gates has said that DNA is like a computer program, but far more advanced than ever, any we've ever created. And this is where sort of th this part of the story intersects with my story. I, was, I attended this conference that I mentioned in Dallas in 1985. I heard the cosmologists talking about the evidence for a creation event, but I also heard scientists talking about the question of the origin of life and how the new discoveries in molecular biology about the information bearing properties of DNA had completely changed the terms of debate. Turns out, by the mid-80s, no one could understand where this information had come from. That was the thing they couldn't explain. If you want to explain the origin of the first life from simpler, non-living chemicals, well, that's all great. You can imagine the chemicals knocking into each other, but how are chemical, undirected chemical reactions going to get you code? That didn't seem very plausible. And one of the scientists at this conference had just written a book called The Mystery of Life's Origin, and in the epilogue to that book, he suggested that the information that was proving so perplexing to everyone trying to explain the origin of life was not evidence of an undirected chemical process, but rather possibly the product of what he called an intelligent cause. And this was Dr. Charles Thaxton, who was in, in Dallas. And his, his reasoning was very straightforward. He said, in our experience, information is a mind product. Software comes from programmers, after all. So maybe you know, we've been working for two decades trying to explain the origin of the information in DNA as a result of chemical reactions, and the chemistry doesn't want to do that. The chemistry, as Jim Tour, you may have seen him online, says, chemistry doesn't care about life. It doesn't want to move in a life-friendly direction. And so Thaxton suggested, well, maybe what we're seeing is evidence of an intelligent cause. Well, I attended the conference, friends introduced me afterwards, and I started going to his office late at night. And over the ensuing year, I received some very, very uh, consequential mentoring. And by the time I 
got to applying for a Rotary scholarship to come to Cambridge, I already knew what I wanted to work on. I wanted to work on this origin of life question, specifically with, the, with wondering whether there might be evidence of actual intelligent desire. Was it possible, I was wondering, that you could formulate a scientific theory or scientific argument for intelligent design? Now, arguably, the person that helped me think this through most was another Cambridge person, again, Charles Darwin. And even though I disagreed with his, his theory about the origin, of, uh, the origin of new forms of life, is he had developed a method of reasoning that uh, directly applied to this origin question. It was a method of historical scientific reasoning. Rather than sitting at the, at the, at the laboratory bench and trying to get uh, some process to uh, occur under controlled laboratory conditions, what historical scientists try to do is look at clues and reason back to what might have caused those clues to emerge. My PhD thesis ended up being called Of Clues and Causes. And so how do you get from the clues back to the causes? And Darwin said, well, there's a way. What you want to do is you want to infer the best explanation. We don't get to see what happened, but we know something about cause and effect, and so we can figure out what is the most likely cause of a given effect that we're looking at in the, in the present if we know how cause and effect works. And while I was working at that, uh, there, uh, at that there was a young professor from the United States who came to do a, a, a job talk here to candidate for a position in my department, the Department of Philosophy of Science here at Cambridge. He ended up getting the job and he left behind a manuscript for me called Inference to the Best Explanation. And he later came and actually rose to, the, to become the, the head of the department. And um, what Lipt, Peter Lipton was his name, and what he highlighted was a, was a question philosophers were asking. Yes, we see the scientists are doing this inferring to the best explanation method, but what makes an ex explanation best? And as I got deeper into his work and some of the work of the 19th century uh, philosophers and scientists, I found a consensus was actually already present, that the best explanation is the one that posits a cause which is known to produce the effect in question. I found this in the work of H William Huell, for whom we are naming our center, and also in the work of Charles Lyell, a famous geologist whose work Darwin read on the Beagle. And when I saw the title page of, of Lyell's book, a light went on for me. Here's, here's his long Victorian title. It says, The Principles of Geology Being an Attempt to Explain the Former Changes of the Earth's Surface by Reference to Causes Now in Operation. And I got to causes now. In, oh, we explain what's, what we see today by reference to causes that we know produce that thing, causes we see at work today. So I asked myself a question. What is the cause now in operation that produces digital code? And I realized there was only one. It was a mind. It was an intelligence. Whenever we see information, especially if it's in alphabetic or digital form, whether it's in a hieroglyphic inscription like the Rosetta Stone at the British Museum, or a newspaper headline, or a section of software code, or information embedded in a radio signal, it always comes from a mind, not a material process.